so I was saying, um, you know, when I was trying to organize comics community stuff, I was doing so from a advantageous position of being in New York City. Tons of tons of art and culture stuff going on here. Um, in the case of now, obviously, I don't live there, so I don't know. But in the case of Juan in Pittsburgh, in the case of Jamilia, Jamila, oh, I'm going to try to get it right. Jam Jamila. <laughs> Jamila. Thank you. Neil and Neil in Southern Florida. There may be a ton of stuff going on there. I don't know. Right. Even Avi. Right. I know you're in the Bay Area, which 10 years ago when I went there, there was a lot of comics community, but I don't know how that city has changed in the last 10 years, right? My recollections of it are the mid 2000s. A lot may have flipped over since then. And if we're taking it into this position of like, okay, well, we wanna help people who are in their own cities, who also may be starting from, you know, places that are not hives of culture. I'm curious, right? What has been your experience of trying to get a comics community going in the cities you live in? Like, how has that gone? Um, I can start since I went from living in New York City for like over 10 years. So I it was very easy to just have a, a large comics community. So moving to South Florida and only knowing um, my family that was down here. But uh, because I co-founded Geek Girl Brunch, uh, which is an international meetup group for women and non-binary folks and meet up over brunch usually, and it's usually themed, Geek Out. It was uh, created years ago by me, Yasel and Rachel um, as a way for us to have like a safe space to just network, make friends, geek out because we know comics and geek culture has a lot of toxic in it so that was our safe space and also for a way for us to meet up and it not only be at a convention so it started small in New York and then it kind of just organically grew a lot larger and now it's international with like thousands of members and it's amazing and so I knew the Geek Girl Brunch Miami crew down here so I was like all right well at least I know a couple of folks I can go to the brunch and be able to meet people so it was kind of like my pre-work, you know, work with Geek Girl Brunch already had me um, have like a little community there waiting for me. And that was something that was really important to us with Geek Girl Brunch is being able to have the folks who are really passionate about creating the community in their city to, for us to like be able to give them the resources and support um, to be able to do that. So I, outside of Geek Girl Brunch though, I just went to as many conventions and festivals and things as I could. I was very eager to make comic book friends. Uh, so I would go to everything comic book related, um, the big cons, the small cons, the like cherry blossom anime festivals, because we were always out there. Um, and so that was a way for me to meet people like just individually and slowly see like the same people over and over at the different events and kind of organically create a sort of connection and friendship and then just through you know living in Miami learning about different organizations that are here um, and signing up for newsletters that was a really big thing for me is like signing up for different newsletters like the new tropic um Oolite, and just you know you again you end up hearing about the different events that are going on in your area even like your local comic book shops they can be talking about different events going on in your area so i kind of just tried to plug into everything and kind of curate my community from that um, and then thankfully neil hit me up <laughs> i was like hey i'm in miami too i do we do comics i'm like yes a friend and so we connected and um, we co-published Sun and Sand together. And um, I've been on a few Radio Studio events and it's been awesome. It's been really great to have like somebody else really passionate about community down here in Miami. Yeah, and I maybe should um, sort of piggyback on, on that. I moved down to Miami or I think around the same time that Jamila did um, I was moving from Chicago, which also like has a, like a pretty vibrant, um, and I guess 
a visible comics community um, with like all the comic shops that are very like like uh, indie friendly um, and all of the the colleges and, and universities that are having like comics programs. Um, there are a lot of people making comics there. Um, and uh, so when I moved down here, I asked around um, about like who's making comics in South Florida and people who had grown up here were like, oh, there's nothing going on. I don't know of anybody who's making comics in South Florida. You're going to be very lonely. Um, and I feel like the first like couple of months I was, and then um, there's an event in Fort Lauderdale called the Small Press Fair, SPF. Um, and, uh, and I signed up for a table for that. And, um, and there I met a bunch of people who were making comics. It was my first experience with like um, people who were self-publishing in South Florida. Um, and so I met a bunch of people and each of them was like, I know one other person who makes comics in South Florida. Um, and it turned out that that one other person was like a different person for each person. So it was like, it became very obvious very quickly that like, um, there were, there were definitely people in South Florida making comics and they just like, didn't necessarily like know each other. Um, and, um, I also had a, a Google alert on, on my, um, account for comics, South Florida and an article about Jamila came up. And so I, I like checked out her website and saw these amazing comics. And so I ordered them from her Etsy and before I could read them and be like, hey, I really love your comics. I'm also in South Florida, let's hang out. She emailed me and was like, hey, are you in South Florida? Do you make comics? And like, and so that's how, you know, that's how it started. And um, yeah, I've had like a ton of fun um, doing the Sun and Sand comic anthology with Jamila. We're um, doing, we did one in 2020, Right, and we're we're producing a second one in um, 2021 that's coming out in November. Um, and there are there's one person in like it like showcases. I don't know the exact number, like eight or ten cartoonists. There's one person between the two issues that like is a repeat. Like all the other cartoonists are different. Um, so that like shows just like how many people in South Florida are are making comics. Um, so while it might not be like visibly, like there are people making comics in your area, it might be that there are tons of people making comics in your area and like, you just need to like find ways to connect with them socially or, um, by putting together a, a fun little anthology. Um, I can hop on. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, it's really, really nice to, to be here and see y'all. Um, uh, I know Neil, uh, from SPX time stuff, but, uh, here in Pittsburgh, uh, Neil, uh, amazingly came to the, the zine fair that I co-organized the Pittsburgh zine fair. Uh, I think that was like two years ago. I don't know time. Uh, uh, but, um, I'm a small town boy. I guess, or relative to the cities that uh, everybody's in. I mean, Pittsburgh is a fairly large city, but for me, um, community has been like the notion of community and kind of like interpersonal relationships with comics and reading and comics making pretty much been uh, like uh, an omnipresent thing for my experience in comics. Um, I'm not uh, someone who was a, like an aspiring comics maker when I was little, not an artist or anything. Um, but here in Pittsburgh, while I was uh, in school, I, I came into comics through uh, Copacetic Comics run by Bill Bushell here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And um, for anyone who has never experienced Copacetic Comics, it's one of the world's best comic shops. It's small, but the uh, kind of the, the density of creator owned work across history is just incredible. There's local work. Bill used to, when SPX in the early 2000s was kind of in a, in a different kind of paradigm relative to national distribution and zine distros and all that stuff. 
He used to go to SPX, spend thousands of dollars uh, on individual artists and bring that stuff to Pittsburgh and kind of use that to plant seeds in his kind of like little mini boxes. And um, so anyway, for me, that's like where I, I came across some uh, work from the folks from the Center for Cartoon Studies. I think it was Sundays 3, um, this like trio little book, belly band, screen printed, and it kind of just blew my mind. I got a Kevin Heisinger CCS handbook thing. And that, that, that's kind of like where my mind started going in a lot of places. And Bill was running um, a show for the first time, I think it was 2010, called PIX, Pittsburgh. Uh, independent comics expo and um, it it kind of like that was my entrance into comics kind of all of those things co-occurring like I don't have a background in like long box comics I don't have a background in manga or anything like that it's always been self-publishing uh, and zines uh, so here what I've been doing, so anyway, that's like in the past, but like what I've been doing is um, running kind of like a floating comics school, if you will, um, called the Pittsburgh Comics Salon. Um, it's been on hiatus since the pandemic, like completely uh, for, for a bunch of reasons, but, but what it used to be um, is it was a monthly get together in the coffee shop underneath Copacetic Comics. And I would lead people through uh, kind of just activities. Uh, it was a making meetup, um, always oriented around making. And that was, that's been at the core of what, what I've been really interested in. Um, and at these meetups, uh, kind of where in the, la in the last two years um, spiraled around, I started this like publication called Field Station where we would make essentially uh, half letter pieces like pages during those sessions. I would collect that stuff, uh, put that together on the photocopier uh, where I used to work at the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council. And uh, at the next meetup, I'd have a big stack to give to anybody in attendance. And then all the remaining copies I took to Bill Bochelle upstairs. Um, and I just told Bill like, give these away to anybody who, who buys local, locally made stuff or anybody who's interested. Um, and that's always been the, the goal. And for me with, with kind of inspired with like Bill's philosophies on his Copacetic Comics website, um, I was really thinking about comics in its history as a commodity form. And this kind of like mantra that has kind of like been the bedrock of like pretty much everything I do is kind of like the vision of comics, like commodity form as community form and all the implications that that has. Um, like for me, what's most interesting is engaging in the modality of communicating with images and words for people offering opportunities for people to uh, kind of have that experience where maybe they don't realize that it's available to them because once they have that, it opens up a million new doors. So, you know, introducing people to activities inspired by the work of like Linda Perry um, and, and that kind of thing. I have a background in linguistics. Um, so I approach comics in this kind of like semantic cognitive science kind of a way, but also totally like do it yourself. So that's kind of like where I've been in my focus uh, in the past year has been teaching online on this platform called Hyperspace Academy. Um, and what I do, uh, sorry, Hyperlink Academy. <laughs> um, they're developing a, a thing called Hyperspace where you can do asynchronous and synchronous video call stuff. But anyway, with that, it's been kind of like people around the world. I teach a class called uh, Comics Making for the Rest of Us and uh, Comics Making for Life. Comics Making for the Rest of Us is, is a club that I do eight weeks, it's like 20 bucks. Um, very similar in spirit to the stuff that Tom Hart does through Saw. Um, and uh, the, the notion of community is the fact that comics is this, this medium of communication. So like getting people to make things together instantly creates community. I'm not interested in uh, like just personally in the kind of like communities around commodity culture stuff. It's, it, it's, it leads down a lot of uh, paths that I don't, feel are really like productive 
uh, even though they might be short-term productive. Um, I think like, just it's not for me kind of a thing. So I focus my energies on creating community through making and thus like the Pittsburgh zine fair is like the, the thing uh, that the other aspect of stuff that I do. So, yeah. Avi. Hey, hey, what's up guys? Um, it's so good to see all your faces. Holy shit. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, uh, my name is Avi. Uh, I am one of the folks running Silver Sprocket. Uh, we're an indie comic publisher from Silver Spr from San Francisco, California. Um, and we're talking about just how to seed community, I guess. Yeah, um, like yeah. It, it always surprised me with Silver Sprocket, especially that I was like, every like before I met you, I was like, well, every cartoonist is out of San Francisco, and then suddenly there you are, and you have this explosion of stuff happening. Well, what's wild is like, so San Francisco obviously has a like a rich historical comic scene, but you wouldn't know that by living here or by trying to make comics here. Because everyone who makes comics uh, doesn't leave their house. It's a solitary activity that people, they make comics by themselves and they read comics by themselves. And I feel like what we're talking about here is really like making a strata, like a, a, a welcoming, nurturing environment for people to actually interact with each other around these comics that they're creating and reading and enjoying. And I mean, I guess like that could be mainstream comics, like Wednesday comic book day to like talk about Spider-Man or whatever, but I have no interest in that. And um, I, uh, I guess like for us, like even though we are in San Francisco, it really the, our engagement of the local comic scene is a very young scene because young people aren't jaded as fuck and are actually excited about making new friends and making connections with other people who share their passions. And, you know, even though so many like elderly famous comic creators live around here, we'd never see them. They're, they're busy doing whatever it is that they do. But um, I really love that we're talking about how to actually make community because this is the most fun and important part for me. And I, I, I know we're, I'm sure we're going to get into like more specifics later of like, you know, best practices or, you know, what that all looks like. But I, I want to share with you guys real quick. Um, so uh, Ashley Robin Franklin is one of the special guests for SPX this year. We published her book, uh, One Million Tiny Fires. Um, but I got into Ashley's work. This is a little comic zine that Ashley made with two of her friends in Austin. I think they were like classmates or maybe they work together. And it's just like, let me see, it's three friends, uh, Stephanie, Ashley, and Michelle. And they all just did like a couple of illustrations on the concept of trash babies. And they collaborated to print them up and make them available. And it's like, if you want to have something exist and have friends to do the thing you're doing, you just have to do it and put it out there in a way that's accessible. So it's like, like punk rockers wear a bunch of patches of all the bands that they like. And that's like, these are acceptable topics of conversation. Like I look like a NASCAR driver advertising all this bullshit, but it's like, I love this band. If you want to talk to me about it, here's a, an, an opening for you. So like with us, um, like I made zines with my friends and we would go to like the punk rock show or the coffee shop or whatever and just have them on the table. And we're not like formally tabling or whatever. We might not even be sitting at the table because it's awkward as hell, but they're on the table and people can just go and look at them. And if they think it's cool, then you have the opportunity to have a conversation about it. Um, and uh, as an example, like Ashley, like, I feel like a lot of people are like, oh, I want to get into comics. I want to have, like, the finished, like, here's the Ben Passmore book we published, Your Black Friend and Other Strangers. It, like, has awards on the back. But this was originally published by Ben as a little photocopy thing that he just did himself. Um, and then we reissued it as this thing, and then it just kind of grew as the, the popularity grew. Like, it didn't, it wasn't fully formed as this, like, hardcover thing. And the same, like, um, Ben's Dayglo a -Hole series has been nominated for some Ignatz Awards and is fantastic. But it started out as this, like, real dinky home photocopied thing that anybody could make if you really feel like it and give a shit. So, um, yeah, for me, I feel like it. you just have to be like, well, where is it that you're comfortable? Where do you interact with other people? 
do you have a friend that you want to make a zine with? Like make a zine with that friend. Um, and I guess I, I don't want to ramble for too long, but I, I have one thing that was really central to, to us getting started that might be helpful to others is um, we come from uh, independent music where there is a community of bands who are friends with each other, but don't have the, um, the clout to even get, get like records into stores or anywhere. Like, you know, you've got, got your community of friends who cares about this thing, but like capitalism doesn't know what to do with it. Uh, and for us, we just would have, as, as musicians, uh, we would self-produce our own records and make like a hundred tapes or whatever. Then we would trade 10 of our tapes with 10 of our friends' band tapes. Then that meant that any time that we set up our merch table to sell our own tapes, we also had this little distro box going of our friends' tapes. So we've completely become our own distribution network for our community, which you can do with comics and zines just as easily by like doing trades with each other. Like, oh, I am selling my own book anywhere I table, but your book is fucking amazing. And I know that people who like my book would like your book too. Let's just trade 10 copies for 10 copies. Then both of you are a distribution point for each other's work and you're building a family of stuff that kind of goes together. And what I really love about that is you're not asking anyone's permission to exist. You're not looking for validation. You're not looking for like, are you doing it right or not? You're just doing it on your own terms, learning as you go, making mistakes and learning from them, but keeping it low stakes and approachable where it's stuff that you and your friends can directly be in control of. And I feel like with that kind of out mentality, it's like you can start a comic scene by having a friend from a class or a friend from work or a neighbor that you want to collaborate with or put up flyers around your neighborhood for like the prompt of the zine or anthology you want to put together that you're collecting like one page submissions for and just just do it and make it real and have it suck, but learn how to do it better. And as you do that, you will build the community around the actual thing that you care about. And thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> no, it, um, I mean, the, that, the, go ahead, Juan. Yeah, that um, that strategy, Avi, of um, kind of like diversifying uh, what, what's available is really great in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, because the what, what's really nice there too in terms of like any people coming like if they don't like my poetry water comics they're really gonna love like the ant battle robot comics that this other person from the comic salon does mm -hmm. um and in some ways that can kind of like be really good for people who are like starting out because by kind of like joining forces and becoming their own kind of like comics voltron locally or whatever um your, your ego takes less of a blow when people don't engage with your work necessarily or or by having different things available less people just totally walk by and and also the people who might have loved your book about water poetry might be like oh this is rad oh there's that that guy's tabling again let's see what's on the table. Oh, I already have your book of water poetry, but oh, what are these other things that you've curated for me? You've gone out and found other stuff that I'm into and I trust your judgment because your last thing was cool. Let me check out these other things that you're, you're repping, you're willing to stand behind enough to put it on your table next to your things. Totally. And that's like listening to music on the radio. Like, uh, I mean, not no, it's making mixtapes for your friends. No, I, I, I guess I listen primarily to like WFMU and art WRCT, like independent radio. What I mean is like people, it, it's essentially it's audio mixtapes, you know, when it's like non-commercial radio, like you, you, there's a DJ who you love listening to on Fridays because they like mix stuff together. And so there's this kind of like trust, there's this like back and forth. And then, um, but then whoever's on the air after them, you're going to still be listening. And there's this serendipity that can kind of happen. So just mixing it up. I can actually, that actually kind of leads into um, what I wanted to ask uh, next um, in a way, a lot of things that were brought up here and, and something again, that I'm very curious about, you know, that, that is going to be very site specific, right? If you're me, 
you live in New York. There's already like what, like two conventions, like when there were conventions, there were already two built in conventions here a year. Like, again, I, I, I'm, I'm lazy, right? Um, and even still, I made my own smaller one. Um, but one of the things I was very concerned with was this idea of visibility, right? Okay, all of us in comics know each other, and and if and if somebody spots us and they get to know us, right? We build up the kind of like good relationship that Avi and Juan were talking about. But I was especially thinking like here, even in the city, like I'm really I was really big into the music scene stuff, and they had no idea what we were doing in comics, right? And if you were in a even smaller place, right, with an even with you know without millions of people in a built-in culture, right, you're going to want to find and appeal to, you know, people who might not already be comics fans, but are fans of art and culture. And so again, through my research, I was like looking at like some of the programs and some of the work all of you were doing, right. Uh, you know, for one, I was like, oh, okay, the Pittsburgh Zine Fair is in collaboration with Union Project, the Union Project's art space. And I was like, okay, that's not that's not a comic book shop, that's something else. So there's a way to tap into another piece of culture there. And, you know, I was looking at the, the Radiator stuff and I was like, oh, okay, I saw the, the, the name Exile Books and Locust Projects, which look, sorry, I've never been to Florida. I don't know what those spaces are. And I want you to tell me about them and tell me what kind of stuff they do. But I was like, those don't sound like comic book shops to me either, right? So there's this way of tapping into other stuff. And Avi, obviously I know, you know, when you would come through town, uh, you would be like, okay, after I go to this, I'm going to a music festival next with all the, the spark plug catalog. And I was like, yeah, that's a really good idea. Like you would be the one person with comic books there as opposed to one comic book artist. Um, um, what kind, so I'm really curious, like what successes or what has been your experience in kind of tying the work all of you are doing to already existing kind of cultural stuff that's happening in the cities you live in? Um, I'm happy to take this one because this is like my my whole thing. <laughs> um, yeah, like, well, we, we got into doing comics. First, like, I don't think anyone, I mean, okay, it, I, I just can't, I can't stand the concept of mainstream comics because I know a lot of people who read comics and I don't know anybody who reads Spider-Man or X-Men or Batman. Like, you're, we're not like, I mean, I'm sure that's totally cool. I support anything that anyone wants to read, but like we all have culture that we're a part of and are exposed to and care about outside of the comic book page. Um, for example, uh, we're in San Francisco, California. And there's like a big old queer scene, gay scene over here. So we published um, Archie uh, Bon Giovanni's um, Yes, I'm Flagging zine. And this is available in like sex shops, uh, plant stores, like all sorts of places that don't carry comic books at all, but this is relevant to what they're doing. And it happens to be a comic book because that's just what, what we made. And uh, we got into comics by doing these, um, as you were anthologies, it was a uh, comics by punk rockers or people in punk rock bands. And so, it, you know, the comic is just the medium. It's like, well, what are movies about? You know, it's like, well, what are comics about? It's the same thing. But um, I absolutely agree that it's like, we're not just trying to have like a, a really tiny exclusive party of, oh, we like comics, not other stuff. Like we, our, our culture exists as part of greater culture all around us. And um, we've got to be, you know, engage with the people around us to be decent people and like have our eyes open. Well, anyways, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. But um, one of the things that we did that was really helpful in expanding the audience for our books, um, I have so many props and visual aids here. I'm like <laughs> Alligator of the SPX panel. Uh, we published Girls by Jen Woodall, which is a collection of just, uh, there goes my book, just a collection of like, you know, badass illustrations of just femmes being, being real cool. And we, um, this was one of the illustrations that was really popular. It's this woman in a, it, in a video game. It's like, you've been catcalled and your options to respond are kill, kill, or kill. And uh, we made um, wheat paste posters, 11 by 17 in black and white. 
we also screen printed some vinyl stickers that were just like four inches. And uh, we just put them up everywhere to be like, th these are, this is a page that we think needs to be in society and our community should see this. And we just put these stickers in like bar bathrooms just to be, be shitheads. But then um, when we have this in our window at our shop, like people come in and are like, oh my God, I, I just sent this to my friends on Instagram. This is the thing I care about. Wow, like this is relevant to my life. Like, this is so cool. And then we get to show them like, oh, well, here are the actual books that Jen Woodall makes. It's not just a, you know, a poster or like a little, like a meme, but a, there's a whole body of work here that is about this. And uh, I think it's important if you, if you make your art and you care about it, like we're not just trying to impress each other. We're, we exist as part of the community. So like you're like engage with that community where they are. Um, I don't think that it starts and ends with the comic book store because I, comic book stores have gotten real weird over the past couple of decades and there's way better places to interact with like-minded individuals. Yeah, I mean, humans cannot survive on comics alone. <laughs> um, I, I really think that con like what we call, this thing that we call comics is really just are the artifacts, they're like an emergent phenomenon of humans trying to communicate asynchronously and then with images and words and that's just it manifests across like so many different ways like the internet physically like posters um so like approaching things the way that, like here in pittsburgh um collaborating with organizations like the union project uh like the, the big goal has been to just treat like i mean for me zine making and comics making Kind of like intertwined but comics you enter this space of like drawing and so like you you end it, it's it's a little different as opposed to zines which is kind of like arranging collecting material um but with the union project the big thing has been um kind of like they're a ceramics space um they it's an old church it's a uh, like fellowship through art stuff and um the zine fair started at the old like the screen printing studio here that's like collectively run the artist image resource um but moving to these spaces uh what's what's really nice or, or the concept really zine spaces in general is really good and useful and fertile because um i mean like it's the zine fair is really just like the book fair. There's a book, there's a zine for anyone about anything. And people have continually said that about comics, you know, that like comics isn't a genre, like it's a medium, whatever. But that's still, by still calling it like a medium, it still gets locked into this like literary culture-ish type of space, even if it's like underground literary culture of like, um, of any kind of like subcultural spaces. But I think fundamentally, like uh, comics are a vessel and they can be filled in with whatever and we can use them and we do use them. We like, use them as missives to show to the world, like we are here. Um, we kind of use them as kind of like bat signals like, um, or like lighthouses too. Like, hey, um, we've been thinking about this, like queer communities put out like publications here, like locally in different cities, um, like here in Pittsburgh, there's, there's a lot of stuff and they're kind of like, I just think about dandelions all the time. Um, and just to, to, to reel it back in, when we self-publish stuff and when we self-publish kind of stuff collectively, it is a way of just like saying like, I exist, we exist, but it isn't just this like planting a flag in the name of Spain. It's also like, usually I'm inviting you to exist too. And I would love to see you exist too. And that's like in zine culture trading, like I made a thing, like I'm really interested in sharing that thing with you. And like, do you have something? No worries if not, like that kind of like reciprocity. It's just, really interesting and returning to the idea that, like people can't survive on comics alone like engaging with other spaces like doing like a pop-up fair during a gallery crawl 
um, is, is a really like productive thing. Just having these, uh, these moments, sometimes like vendor oriented, like in other like spaces can be really like useful because people stumble upon this way of packaging images and words that maybe they haven't come across very much in their life. Um, and I'll just like explain really quickly about Exile and, and, and Locust Projects. Um, so I, in the beginning of 2019, I had the opportunity to, um, to run like a pop-up shop for a couple months. Um, and that was like a great opportunity. Radiator Comics like primarily distributes people's self-published comics and small press comics. Um, and so I was like, oh, I'll have a little store. Um, and um, I used to work at Quimby's Bookstore in Chicago, which has an open consignment policy. So anybody anywhere who's like self-publishing stuff can send them their, their comics and they'll sell them for you. Um, so I, I adopted that, that policy for specifically for people in Florida. Anybody in Florida could consign their, their comics through the, the pop-up shop. Um, and because of that pop-up shop, um, Exile Books, which is a local zine shop and art gallery, and also the organizers for the Miami Zine Fair, um, they uh, they weren't doing anything with their space that summer of 2019 um, because nobody likes being in South Florida in the summer. Um, and so they were like, "Do you want to run? Do you want to move your pop up shop here?" And I was like, "Sure." Um, but then they uh, they were like, "One of the conditions was that I should organize some some." Um, some programming. So um, we did some, some readings, Jamila read at one of them. Um, and uh, we also did a night where um, there's a local organization called um, the Miami Drawing Club, uh, where um, this, this is a, like a great example of, of community building. Um, this designer, Edwin Beauchamp, um, just like reserves a space usually at a bar um, and just puts out a huge sheet of paper and brings markers and, and pens and stuff like that and just invites people to come and draw. And, um, you know, and people who are in the bar who don't know that it's happening, like stumble upon this like giant sheet of paper with, with um, where you can just draw. And every like 20 minutes, an alarm goes off and, and Edwin has everybody like shift around. So you're not always like, drawing in the same space or drawing next to the same person. Um, so we did an event uh, with, um, with the Miami Drawing Club there. Um, and that was really great. That was a lot of fun. And then um, Locust Projects, which is uh, I think Miami's oldest alternative art space. Um, uh, they um, were having a show in December, um, like November, December of 2019 with um, Trenton Doyle Hancock. Uh, and it was an amazing show, um, and it featured a lot of his comics pages, uh, and um, they have a backspace, and they were like, what do you want to do with the backspace? And he said, I want a comic shop in, in that space. Um, and um, I learned that I was not their first choice, but I was the, the available choice, and so um, they, they asked if I could do a, a pop-up shop there, and so I did more workshops there, um, and that was a lot of fun. Um, and I, I loved um, sort of being able to like bounce off of um, Trenton's work. Um, so I ordered stuff that was specifically sort of like reflected um, the types of stuff that, that he does and the, the artists that he's in conversation with. Um, and, uh, and then those workshops and um, sort of actually led directly into Radiator Comics Studio, which is sort of the like, um, a, this like, now it's been over a year of, of doing like online programming of, um, that encourages people to, to sort of come together and work on their comics. Um, and uh, yeah, I kind of lost my chain of thought. So I'm gonna stop okay. right there. Uh, Jamila, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, not as much as everybody else. I like had, I guess like my perspective was interesting being able to uh, take advantage of Neil's spaces that he was using in, in Miami and, you know, doing the reading and seeing all these people there that I had never seen before. And I feel like that happens a lot um, 
in Miami where I go to these different events that are about comics and I end up seeing a lot of new people and then of course there's some familiar faces but it just slowly reminds me like yeah we are out here it's hot so we're not always out here but if you have a comics event uh related you know people will come and so um like the Miami Zine Fair was and SPF were two really big places where I met a lot of comics folks like I would just kind of go around and and Supercon which is like a read pop thing but I'm like are you local are you making you know folks who are making comics and then following them and then you know seeing what other artists they follow that are in the area and just like building that sort of network organically so um yeah that's just my little add-on tangent to that <laughs> Jamila um mm -hmm. you made me think about something um when, when you mentioned all of these kind of like different actors got in, in a local community, something that I've found um, like when I'm, when I'm hosting the fair, it's a lot of work and it's really stressful um, and it's really tiring. And I oftentimes don't get to share or take advantage of anything, but like uh, it it really just like fills me with so much life to see the kinds of interactions that kind of like setting the table for this kind of like cultural dinner party to happen. Like you invited like these thousand attendees, you invited these people with like low costs of like tables. So you, you made this thing happen and that's really satisfying, but it's really tiring. And so like, Sometimes when people go into this space of like, I want to create community, um, kind of like you, sh some people like feel like they have to shoulder the whole thing on their shoulders and it can burn out. It can create a lot of bitterness, a lot of resentment, a lot of underappreciation. So kind of like Jamila, what you were saying to me brings forward the idea that I think that like, I think it's really important, I think, and this is happens i think like organically in large places small places i think it's like a system dynamic but is this kind of like turn taking um not there's never a kind of like a there really it doesn't benefit this kind of like monopolization of uh scene management it's, it's unsustainable you can't do it anyway um but like if, if anyone listening to this is interested in in fostering something, don't feel like you need to tackle this like whole large problem. Just start small and create an op a, a space for other people to have interactions that maybe they can't usually have. They'll appreciate that and they'll create a space for others and probably you. So just that thought. Um, I'd love to piggyback on that because it was reminds me exactly of what happened with Geek Girl Brunch. Like it started organically, like me and my friends are hanging out, posting our pictures on Instagram, hashtag Geek Girl Brunch. And then people are like, oh, that looks like fun. And we start dressing up because we just love an excuse to dress up. And then we were like, oh, like maybe we should make this a thing because folks seem interested and we're passionate about it. We know a lot of people we want to see our other friends in the city. And so that started to just grow and grow. And we started it in New York City. And then other cities were like, oh, I wish that was here. And we we're like, oh, we should do that. And then it just kept growing and growing. And it was still the three of us managing a lot uh, of it. So <laughs> as, as the years went on, it was, uh, it was really difficult. It took uh, a lot of time. Um, we were really passionate about it. And um, we eventually were able to, we knew like, okay, this isn't sustainable for us anymore. And also it will be better if we hand this over to like a new group to run. You know, we have all these resources, we have this community uh, and this Facebook group of the people who run all the different chapters around the world and stuff. So we have created like a good um, system for this to exist without us. So we made sure when we left, um, like as far as like running it the day to day and stuff that we made sure that transition was really good. But one of the things that I wish I knew was like, 
hey, don't get excited and start <laughs> growing before you actually have like the time and like mental, you know, physical space to do all of that because it can get really overwhelming and you don't want to end up like presenting the work or, you know, just losing the love for it. So that's something that I learned that way. And I try to bring into like new things that I create and just always try to like, hey, hey, hey girl, you're getting excited, but let's chill. <laughs> like you don't want to overwhelm yourself. And so, and also a lot of people are down to support and help. And that's like the beautiful thing about comics and like it doesn't, it, it's not very difficult to find other people who would be interested in, in supporting and helping. You all are doing wonderful in that like you're anticipating my questions before I even ask them. <laughs> like I, you know, I was directly gonna be like, okay, like tell me more about like how Geek Girl Brunch was run. Um, no, yeah, you, you all hit on something very true though. Cause like I got in that position where I got burnt out doing doing that kind of work. And, you know, uh, so thank you Juan for, for bringing it up and talking about it. And, and only now in New York, I'm seeing, um, it's really wild. There's gonna be like a micro convention at the end of the month here. And I was like, oh, thank goodness. Somebody else is doing it that isn't me. Like this needs to exist, but like, it can't be me anymore. So when you see somebody else doing it, you're like, oh, that's awesome. Perfect, wonderful. But the thing that was really weird to me about it was, hey, wait, you're doing a, like a small convention here. We're still in 2021. Um, it's, it's even weird that we're having this talk because all of us who are doing this kind of work, we've, we've kind of been hobbled in a way by the fact that like, the, the pandemic, like we can't pretend that's not real. Um, but then I saw, like Neil, you've been doing. I I watched some of the programming you did you put on, and it is incredible. Like the people you've you've brought together, and I'm really impressed by the way it was not only just panel talking, but it was a lot of like how to make comics, and that's something that I feel is severely lacking. Right? I teach introdu introductory comics, and always my students are like am I allowed to do this? Is this okay that I'm doing this? And it's like, yeah, no, it's fine. Just, just do it. Right. Like it, it's cool. Um, and I know one, I looked and saw that uh, the picks, the Pittsburgh comic salon was still continuing online. Right. Um, Avi, I know you've been, oh, the store on Valencia has been open this whole time. Like, despite what we are dealing with, in this 2020, 2021, how do you how do you feel you've been able to keep things moving in terms of keeping your local comics community going? Right? Has online been enough? And on top of that, has the fact that it's online in a lot of instances um, been a way to get people to invite people in who might not otherwise have come in? Uh, I've kind of had the reverse where um, because everyone's stuck at home, we're getting a lot more local people who have never read comics before. Um, like, because we we have a shop, uh, our gallery shop office HQ is one building that's accessible to the public. Um, and this year, um, the San Francisco Zine Fest is online because they can't, the, the venue that they rent from the city just literally isn't open. Uh, so they had the... Um, the, the capitalism component, uh, the retail, we gave them a couple of tables at our shop to set up uh, all the zines of everyone who wants to sell stuff. But um, we're getting like tons of people from our neighborhood who are like, okay, I've walked by this window a hundred times. I cannot figure out what the hell is happening in here. This just looks weird. What is this? And, uh, and now we've got a ton of, because everyone can't do anything. They've all had to learn how to read again. Um, so we've got a lot of people who are now reading comics who have never been into it before. And it's really fun. Like we get to curate, we're getting them turned on to like all sorts of weird indie bullshit that like they probably would have just totally glossed over had it not been a pandemic. But like, I mean, online, like we've always posted our comics on the internet for free and tried to make them accessible and easy for people to read. Like, you know, we're not, we're not trying to hide these comics away. We want 
like we're deliberately trying to be part of conversation and culture and um you know we're I, I don't think pandemic or not we should not be trying to hide away our work and keep it from people we should always be trying to get it out there where people can read it was that the question at all did i totally no, sideways around no, it? no 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 totally like <laughs> um very positive for me these past two years for what i do has been garbage just straight garbage um uh robin you mentioned that the comic salon was continuing it, it's not um uh, i can't i can't do it digitally um i was trying at the beginning of the pandemic um but the the energy just wasn't there um there's a serendipity of meeting physically um and especially like in in Kyber Coffee, like uh, where it happens on Dobson Street here in Pittsburgh, uh, like underneath Copacetic Comics, and usually Bill Bushell stays open an hour later, so that people can come early, maybe from their jobs or catch the bus, pick up something, talk to Bill or whatever, and then come down till eight. We started doing it, and it was like the like a core of people, and um, it. It just it, it was it wasn't very productive for people, and um, I don't know about anybody else here, but like I have not found that like remote conferences or anything like that related to zines or comics have been very like useful live stuff. Asynchronous like getting this kind of like video conversation like focus to happen where people can watch at their convenience. I think that's been very, very good for people, but like digital zine fests where you like, you have to, like, you have like windows of time to like vend or a store for, I knew, I knew somebody who did like the New York art book fair or something like that. And they told me it was like a semi disaster. Maybe if you were like a well-known art book, something or whatever, like maybe it worked out for you, but it, it just, it doesn't work. And like in the zine fair, our venue, um, like we moved from the union project to, to like to a place that like completely shut down. Um, and then we spent the whole year this year trying to find a new venue, but like that didn't fall through, but serendipitous. I mean, we arrived at the idea of doing something that's like accessible and healthy and physical and still allows for serendipity. And that's like kind of what maybe becomes an annual tradition um, because I think it's really at the beating heart of zines which is kind of doing like a straight up zine swap. Invite people, hey, bring 30 copies of like a zine or some zines from your collection and just swap, no selling, just swapping. We'll have pizza, we'll have some food. Um, we'll have somebody playing music. Like, like it'll be a mask event so everybody can be safe. Um, and, and then there's like a focus on makers, but, but yeah, like with the pandemic, um it's been really difficult and then my own priorities too like I, I've had to like make it like take care of myself first you know like when the plane's going down you got to put your oxygen mask on first before you help anybody else that's that's really like how I personally felt I don't know about anybody else um so I've had to like focus on like my own like making a living um and I don't do that with with comics Right. So, and I, I don't do that with the comics community stuff, but through it all, um, I have been doing my best to create these like little spaces and, and they've been really good. And that's why I mentioned the hyperlink Academy thing. Um, I've been doing several cohorts of these like weekly two hour long drawing club sessions. Um, and those have been really, really good. Cause again, to me, the, the notion of community is like a making community um, without the pressure of finished publications. So just let's make a space for, for nurturing something. And going to something that Avi said earlier, I think this whole space of community and creating like fertile spaces, really what we're doing is like nurturing these things that are like fragile and small to kind of like emerge into and coalesce into a small thing that maybe becomes something more but maybe it doesn't, you know, um, maybe the zine, you iterate on it again and it turns into something else or this like page, it becomes part of a larger thing, but you were creating these spaces where it's okay for it to just be what it is and more broadly allow people to be where they are 
in their reading of comics, in their making of comics, and just be where they are. And like, it's totally okay. Because oftentimes in this culture, you, it, it just isn't okay to be where you are. There's always like this constant feeling that's going to be pushed on you that like, you're not enough. Whatever you've done isn't enough. So that's like, for me in like the digital spaces and the physical, like what I've like strived, but pandemic hard for, for baby Juan. I mean, the pandemic has definitely been, I think hard for a lot of people. Um, I mean, not, I wasn't saying that like to be like, oh, well, it's been hard for a lot of people. I'm like hearing you Juan and saying that it's been, been hard for you um, and for all of us. Um, I think there have been some like, fun things that have happened online. Um, I think the Massachusetts Indie Expo, um, Indie Comics Expo, MICE, um, and the um, the San Francisco Zine Fest have done some really cool like exhibitor show and tells um, that have been really fun to watch where people sort of have like five, like either one minute or five minutes to just like talk about their comics or their zines. And it's been really refreshing just to like, to watch those. Um, they're on YouTube. so if people can, can search those. Um, so those are, have been a lot of fun. Um, I have been doing a lot of programming online um, since the pandemic. Um, so sort of going back to what I was talking about before, like the workshops at the pop-up shops were really exciting for me. Um, and there was uh, the Knight Foundation was, um, had a call for proposals for a Knight Arts Challenge grant. Um, and so I proposed like, this was, the end of 2019, I was like, I, I want to do like a year long physical space workshop kind of space for comics where we'll have a bunch of drafting tables and people can come and work on their comics in downtown Miami. And um, we'll have events, people can do readings and workshops and that sort of thing. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then, um, then the pandemic happened. And like, I, like I had the keys for the space in my hand. Oh my God. Um, and uh, and everything shut down. And so I had to sort of like reconfigure what that was gonna look like. And what I landed on was doing a series of like panel events, um, including a series called Nuts and Bolts, which was specifically, you know, I wanted to keep like um, some, some aspects of it, specifically South Florida. So Nuts and Bolts was a series of panels that um, I did that were uh, like specifically, um, people talking about one aspect of like writing or penciling or inking, um, story development, coloring, that sort of thing. And all of the artists were either, um, so I had some sort of connection to South Florida or Florida in general. Um, and th those were a lot of fun um, and just sort of like organizing different panels. Um, but actually the thing that, that got really exciting for me in this like online space was um, sort of trying to translate that like that workspace into uh, like a Zoom venue. And so um, I started hosting uh, this thing called Open Studio where every single Friday um, we've uh, just from like four to 6 p.m. Eastern time, I open up the Zoom room for Radiator Comic Studio and people join in and I set a timer for 20 minutes and everybody just like quietly works on their comics. And then at that 20 minute timer, we have a 10 minute break where people can socialize and like talk about making comics or anything they want. Um, and then we do another 20 minutes. Um, this is heavily inspired by um, Susan Laurie Park's Watch Me Work, uh, which at the beginning of the pandemic, she took um, virtually to do uh, Watch Me Work From Home, which is um, a performance that she's been doing for like 11 years um, of, uh, doing like 20 minutes of writing and then 40 minutes of talking about writing um, where participants would ask her questions about their work. So it's, it's a little different because I didn't want to like create like an expert, um, you know, like pupil kind of situation. I wanted it to be more like uh, democratic. But since then we also started um, Cartoonist Coffee, which is like sort of like a social, just like you so, show up on a Sunday and you just like, chat with people and it's little small group, like three or four people in a breakout room. And then that's for 15 minutes. And at that 15 minute mark, we like come back into the big room and then reshuffle and then go back into the smaller groups. And so like a group of folks, not from South Florida, from all over the country sort of have come together 
Um, and at one open studio, they were like, can you start a discord for this? And I was like, okay, we'll start a discord. So now we have a discord. Anybody's welcome to join our discord, um, where we talk about all sorts of aspects of comics. And from that, um, somebody was like, Hey, it would be great if we had like an, an advice sort of like feedback critique group sort of situation where I could get advice for my comics. And instead of me being like, okay, I'll organize that. Um, somebody else was like, I can organize that, which is super exciting for me. Um, and so we just had the first session of that um, uh, last week. And that was really fantastic. It was another like breakout room where it was like three or four people in the room and each person had a turn to sort of like talk about something that they were working on that they needed advice on. Um, and, uh, and so, and then everybody else gave feedback. Um, so it's those like now um, kind of across the country, like connections that people are making on like a peer to peer level. That's really exciting for me. Um, I've pretty much like stopped planning the, the like the, the more panel type discussions. Um, so that's amazing, Neil. That's, that's really, really cool. And like, it's really inspiring. That's rad as hell. How do people sign up for the Discord? We can go to radiatorcomics.com slash studio. Um, something I wanted to add, I am not, because I'm a publisher and writer, I've been on a lot of these virtual events. And I also um, have chronic pain. And so I have been really happy to just not have to like, I mean, I wish the pandemic wasn't happening, of course, but I like the option and the opportunity to have and it's like and be at events virtually um, and watch events virtually and just having that be more accessible, um, whether it's like, you know, watching it live and then having that safe to watch later. Um, like I've been on um, a few that were really exciting to just like see people chatting with you live while you're, uh, you know, having your events and, um, and then being able to then just take that link and then share it with folks, you know, in my newsletter or online that they can watch later. Uh, it's something, the virtual like events are something that I hope can stay in some form after the pandemic because I think it helped um, me just participate more in like all these little comics communities all around you know the country and world like I may not have been able to go to you know a event in California but since now they're hosting their stuff online I could watch it um, and maybe they wouldn't have done that before so I hope that it's something that they that we like keep around because it's been it's helps like I think our communities like it's helps put a spotlight on our our individual communities and uh, and let other folks participate without having to fly out here to hot Florida. <laughs> yeah, it's a kind of a accommodation that like really benefits in in a lot of uh, dimensions that and it, there's very low cost. Um, to do it. I think another really great thing about this kind of thing that we're doing right here um, is it serves as a kind of posterity for uh, conversations and scenes that usually are extremely ephemeral, um, that like you had to be there kind of a thing. So in whatever this new world looks like, if we can achieve some kind of a hybrid um, uh, synchronous, like physical, like, like kind of a thing. It, it'd be good. I mean, you know, SPX has been posting their things online for like over a decade, if I'm not mistaken, you know, but it's, I think more of like these like smaller things. My, the thing I was saying earlier about like digital events and garbage is the, the stuff that's not like this, but the stuff where there's some weird new protocol that people are being asked to engage in. Like Neil, your events are these like, essentially you're creating a digital coffee shop, you know? It's this like studio, it's this like place to gather. Um, and so like, that's totally different. Um, but yeah, like that's kind of like where, where, where my head's at. But yeah, Jamila, like that, that idea of going to the, take, taking like the lessons here um, 
it's, I think, like really invaluable. I don't want to lose it either. I mean, it used to be my job, <laughs> sort of uh, my hobby to know about all the local scenes. And and because like I used to travel around the like the, my way to travel around the country was to be like, hey, there's a comic book show there. OK, like, cool. Now I'm going there. Like, you know, that that was my impetus to be in a place. And one of the really interesting things about doing, you know, getting my mind around this project was I was like, oh, wow, there is something going on in Pittsburgh. I had no idea. Like, now I'm really excited to learn about that. And, you know, like, oh, wow, there's way more going in, on in Miami than just my buddy Neil's down there. Like, that's so exciting. And, like, even though it may be a long time before I ever get to go there, um, just a reminder that all these things are happening. And there are probably a lot of stuff happening, you know, of people who are not on the call that, you know, if you're watching this, I want to I want to let you know, as somebody who's been in this for almost 20 years, I totally want to know what you're doing, because it's probably really cool. And I wish I could visit it, like, because I would get to experience this other kind of little culture through the thing I, I'm very familiar with. Um, and that kind of is one of the things that also got was really interesting to me, especially um, in Neil and Jamila's work about with Southern Florida and the, the Sun and Sand anthology was that you were doing work, you were putting out art about the place that you were making the art, right? Um, and that was like, that helps me have a little, like, it's not the same as visiting, but it gives me a bit of a window into the place that the art is coming from, not just, you know, the artists themselves and just comics in general. Um, and I was wondering if in doing your comics organizing work, if in organizing events, if in being a publisher, if in being a store, if in creating workshops, you started to find out more about the place you were in, right? Especially because like, you know, some of, you know, like with, with Neil, it's like, I know you just, you moved to Miami, right? It wasn't that you had always been there, you know? Yes. Oh <laughs> I was like, no, no, please, will it be me or you? No, 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 please. <laughs> um, uh, doing Sun and Sand has been so awesome because, especially since I moved here a few years ago, I still feel like I'm finding out about Florida and all its quirks <laughs> all the time. And it was really, it, especially doing two of them now, um, you know, the second one's coming out later, the, it's been really interesting to see the similarities of stories that are pitched and, and that we end up publishing and then um, the ones that are really different, but still like you really get a sense of South Florida. Um, there's, it's a really interesting place. <laughs> like there's like, you know, it's a, a large immigrant community, um, a lot of Spanish speakers, there's a like the tropics, the, the animals around, like the weather. There's just so many things that um, give South Florida such like interesting personality. And it was really exciting to see it come out in all these different ways in people's comics. Um, and so I learned about, I think there was like certain things that I thought like, oh yeah, like mangoes are a big deal in South Florida. Like and then realizing like, oh yeah, it wasn't just me thinking that, like we have a lot of comics that folks would wanna write about mangoes or manatees and just like, um, or immigrant stories, uh, dominoes, like all these different things that really like make South Florida, um, you know, what it is. And, and what I really liked with Sun and Sands and what I like, I always want like my comics and, and any comics that I publish, I want people who don't read comics to like feel like it's accessible to them. Um, and so with Sun and Sand, um, I was really excited because it's like, oh, well, 
if you live down here, you should hopefully enjoy this comic, even if you have never read comics before. Um, and we initially planned on distributing this last year during Free Comic Book Day, but then COVID happened. So we um, posted it online, it's free to read online, and then folks could also request to get a copy uh, mailed to them and they just pay for shipping. And so, um, but even when we had planned to put these in like these physical locations, it wasn't just gonna be comic book shops, it was gonna be libraries, it was gonna be these other areas in Florida, like uh, coffee shops, um, galleries, like other places that we thought the people who attend those or who go to those venues would be interested and open to like reading these comics and just spreading the comics goodness around um south florida so that has been yeah it's been a really exciting thing i've learned a lot and i feel like it's like reaffirmed a lot of these things uh, i've literally just heard like a rooster crow in the background which is a very florida thing so yeah um i yeah it, it just it's it adds another layer i think to to like the personality um of this city or you know of, of this area i agree that was a very like yes i i sign on it, 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 because it's interesting because like there is that sort of like oh well they're all the comics are going to be about mangoes right but like mangoes are like a thing here and then, but then there are also like comics like Jamila, your comic in the, the first issue was like, it was about like the, the coral reef uh, like park here. And then um, there's one in the next issue um, uh, that by uh, Chica Pondexter who like, it's just about how like the, the fact that it rains like every single day in during the summer, like how that affects her mood and her productivity and it's like oh well but that's very much about like the place that we're in but it's not like the stereotypical things that you think about when it comes to south florida um in pittsburgh there was this anthology uh organized by this guy andy scott um and kind of helped out with by like a, a bunch of people particularly like steph neary and nate mcdonough um and he doesn't do it anymore because he doesn't have the bandwidth and um, like a lot of reasons, but um, like anthologies like Andromeda and Sun and Sand that have this kind of like regional focus. Um, for, for Sun and Sand, are, are there like themes that you kind of like solicit work with or are people just submitting stuff or? No, it's just like, um, it has to be about or take place in South Florida. Okay. Cool. Great. Yeah. So what's really nice is like without soliciting anything, these kinds of works, um, I mean, Andromeda was entirely regionally focused. So like if you lived here, you can make any kind of thing, but even, even the kinds of like, like fantasy or uh, just like gag comics or whatever, they, they have this like Pittsburgh feel um, that is inevitable um, so the, these kinds of, so anybody who's listening, if you're interested in like making an anthology, you don't, you don't need to organize too much. Just like the people around you is going to create a vibe that's really like unique to like wherever you live, whether it's like New Mexico, whether like you live in Utah or like, I don't know, Kentucky. Um, but like, what's really interesting to me personally with these kinds of publications, stuff from the eighties, nineties, like now, is they, whether we realize it or not, um, they function as these kind of like time capsules, um, these aesthetic time capsules of, and, and, and I think long-term, the value of these artifacts, these zines and these anthologies is that like that moment in that place that they get together. Um, and I think online anthologies maybe where people are, I don't know, it's like a Pokemon anthology comics thing and people are submitting stuff from around the world. That has its value and can be its own kind of time capsule. Um, but I'm not nearly enough of a, like, a digital citizen to 
appreciate that as much as the, the, the physical locality um, aspect with, with, with some kinds of like publications. There, there's a gestalt that comes out of them um, that brings people closer together, like the makers, brings the readers together. And then across time, it, it creates this like landmark of a moment in this like small, maybe independent creative community. I feel like it's worth mentioning. Um, there's the the Baileys in the Bay Area is like making like putting out really amazing like anthologies that are showcasing folks in the Bay Area. And then there's also um, Rust Belt Review, right? That's yeah, Sean like, Knickerbocker. Yeah, sort of like Midwest, Mid Atlantic, like state kind of anthology. Yeah, and I know, and I know since it's semi-timely like the work you know carta is doing kind of in the in the michigan and i can't believe i'm blanking on the name of their publication Discat? you know their press but um discat yeah yeah discat like though yeah those things like all the and 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 very much want like i agree with juan that like the thing we don't even realize is is 10 years from now like that will be our record mm -hmm. and that will be the thing that you know when we when we get burnt out or when we move or we're just too tired or old to do this stuff like that is the kind of work that if there is a record for it hopefully the next people to take up this work can build on what we've done, like, or remember what has been done or see that it has been done at all um, to know that it's your turn now. Now it is your turn to be the nexus of this, of this local scene, you know, and we can come visit as, as old folks. <laughs> um, but I think we, we are at time now. Um, you all are great at talking, like you all are smart and wonderful and, are doing amazing things. Um, so thank you, thank you all for coming. This was great. I, I'm glad we could put this together. It, you know, unless there's anything, if there's anything left you, we we didn't cover, I think I think we got a lot down. Can I say one thing? And yeah. I, I think this is just like, um, like yes, I think that it is like that is it is a good like cap time capsule, but I don't think anybody should like wait for like any of us to stop doing the thing like if like there's somebody else in Miami who wants to like organize stuff that's like comics related that's amazing I'm sure that's the case in you know Pittsburgh and and in the Bay Area too like you know um do it do it with yeah. friends there's I will be there for everyone more virtually <laughs> yeah for sure like a rising tide lifts all boats. Like we're not trying to be the like in charge people. We want to show that like, if we could do it, you definitely could do it. <laughs> so Yeah, I'd rather if you did. <laughs> it, it'd be, yeah, like do it better than us. You won't have much trouble. Just, you know, it's any, we will answer any questions to the best of our abilities that you can definitely, you're definitely better suited. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, amazing talking to all of you guys. Hell yeah, good conversation and the kids are going to keep on outdoing us and I love it as it should be yeah all right well thank you all thank you thank you